Amen. Amen. Man, can we give some praise to the Lord Most High this morning? Amen. The one who reigns forever and ever. Y'all can grab a seat. So good to see you today. Welcome to church. Uh, If you were with us last week, we kicked off a brand new sermon series that we're calling Unseen Enemy, where we're talking about the reality that there's a spirit world that exists outside of the physical world, that that what we see in front of us is not all that meets the eye, that there's more going on than what we realize. Now, I also realize that when I start talking like that, some of you are like, man, like, aren't we more evolved than that? Uh, Like, they used to think that demons caused physical and psychological issues. We just know so much more now. And I get it. Like, not all of our problems uh, are the result of some sort of demonic influence. Um, There are physical and environmental issues that factor in as well. And Jesus doesn't deny that. Jesus doesn't pit the spiritual realm and the physical realm against one another. But what I'm asking you to consider is that when you think about the depth of evil in the world, does it really make sense to blame that all on physical causes? I mean, when you think about some of the horrific things that have happened over the course of history, or even some of the horrible things that are happening in our world today, I mean, you think about the Hezbollah and Hamas attacks on Israel and the constant conflict in the Middle East. You just think about the evil that's present there. Or I don't know how many of you are tracking with this stuff that's going on with Puff Daddy or P. Diddy or Sean Combs or whatever he goes by now. Um, The rapper and business mogul who's been accused of a massive sex trafficking operation along with a whole host of other really dark and heinous things. Over the course of decades, I mean, when you you hear about evil like that and and you look around and you see it present in the world, uh, there's no denying that there are spiritual forces of darkness that are driving those actions. And so today I want to talk specifically about demons. I want to talk about where they came from, what they are, how they operate in the world today, and how we can resist them, how we can oppose them and their influence in our lives. And so to get started, when we think about Satan, we need to remember that Satan was not always the bad guy. In fact, he started out as an angel, as the most beautiful and brilliant angel of all. He was known as Lucifer, also referred to as the morning star. Um, Satan was, God created all things, and Satan was just a created being. He was a created angelic being. So what happened? Well, Lucifer who became Satan, decided that he wanted to be God. He wanted to be like God. He was jealous of God. He wanted to be God. And so he led a rebellion against God, which resulted in him being kicked out of heaven along with a third of his angel followers that had rebelled along with him. And those angels who were once beautiful, glorious, heavenly beings are now spiritual forces of darkness that we refer to as demons. You see this in places like 2 Peter 2 verse 4 where it says, God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. Or Jude 6 which says, And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness, until the judgment of the great day. When Lucifer said, I will be like God, God said, no you won't. No created being rivals me. And so Lucifer and his minions were kicked out of heaven and cast to the earth. Now, as we talk about demons, we need to be careful to remember that Not every bad thing that happens in your life is caused by demons. Like, just because you're having a bad hair day doesn't mean your hairbrush is possessed by demons. Just because you get in a car accident doesn't mean that there's demons in your car, in the engine or something. Just because your kids are acting out and being all crazy doesn't mean you need to cast demons out of them all the time. Like, maybe they just need a nap. Maybe they're a cranky teenager or something, just having a bad day, right? 
And so not every problem in your life is the cause is caused by demons. And so what I want to do is I'm going to look at four things according to scripture that demons do. First of all, demons influence the leaders of nations. I mean, think about this. If you want to have a massive impact on a huge group of people, one of the best ways to make a dent is by going after the leaders of nations because they affect policy, they affect change, they guide and steer and direct the course of that nation. And maybe as you look around the world and you see some of the evil that's happening, you, you, you see dark things going on in parts of the world, you see dictators that are oppressing and subjugating their own people in their own country that's having a huge destructive impact on the lives of individuals and the lives of people in the entire nation. As you look around and you see some of these things happening in the world, maybe you're going, man, what's going on? Well, here's the thing. Behind those leaders may be some demonic forces trying to bring about the will of the enemy. Daniel 10, 13 helps illustrate this. The context is that Daniel had prayed, and for 21 days, three weeks, he didn't hear anything from God. No word from God whatsoever. And then, finally, an angel of the Lord showed up and said this to Daniel. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for 21 days. So who was the prince of the kingdom of Persia? Well, this wasn't an actual person. It wasn't a human being. But rather, it was an evil angel. It was a demon that was associated with the Persian Empire, who was rebelling against God's purposes and rebelling against God's plans. Verse goes on to say, The prince of the kingdom of Persia, this demonic force, withstood me for 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, who elsewhere is referred to as an archangel, he's the chief among angels, he came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia. Daniel was given a a vision that this demonic force would rise up and influence the leaders of the Persian Empire. And Israel would face repeated attacks from the Persian Empire over the course of their history. The Persian Empire just kept coming at the people of Israel. And, and, and if you, you look at it even today, like what is modern day Persia? Does anybody know what modern day Persia is? It's Iran. And so what we see is that this nation continues dominance over and really seeking complete obliteration of Israel. As a Shiite Shiite Muslim nation, um, Iran persecutes followers of Jesus, which seems to indicate that this spiritual force, the, the prince of the kingdom of Persia, is still at work today, seeking to overthrow that nation, and working through the leaders of this nation. This happens all around the world. I mean, if you think about some of the horrible things that have happened over the course of history, you think about the Holocaust, you think about genocide, you think about names like Hitler, or Stalin, or Mao, you think about some parts of the world where there's tremendous evil being carried out by, by dictators who are oppressing and subjugating their people. You think about countries where the leaders of government have no issue persecuting, imprisoning, or even going so far as to murder anyone who claims the name of Jesus. You think about that kind of evil and that kind of darkness, that kind of unchecked abuse of power. I think it just highlights the fact that there are evil, spiritual, demonic forces at work trying to influence the leaders of nations. As followers of Jesus... Our call is to pray for our leaders, to pray for those who are in authority over us. And and when we pray, we should pray offensively, not offensively, like not in a disrespectful kind of way, but pray offensively. We get to pray in advance. We get to pray for God's covering and protection over the leaders of our nation. We should pray for those who are in authority over us. Paul calls us to this in 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2. Where he says, first of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, 
that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Paul says, pray for those who are in leadership over you. But you know, in our nation, we have the incredible privilege not just to pray for those who are in authority over us, but we have the opportunity to influence the trajectory of our government and our leadership through casting a vote. And so I just encourage you, on November 5th, get out there and vote. Let your voice be heard. But first, spend some time in prayer. Pray for God's wisdom. Pray for guidance. Pray for discernment. And then allow that to influence your vote. Second thing the demons do, they desire to inflict suffering on us. I want to take you to a story in Matthew chapter 7, beginning of verse 14. This is what it says. And when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him and kneeling before him, this is Jesus, they said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures and he suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was healed instantly. Here we see Jesus confronting a demon who was seeking to destroy the life of this little boy. And so I want you to think about your kids, your grandkids. There are spiritual forces of darkness that are trying to get at them. And they're trying to get at you. There's another story in scripture, in Mark chapter 5. This is the story of Jesus encountering a demon-possessed man, a demoniac. And this man was so strong and so fierce and so mighty that they would shackle him up with chains, but the chains couldn't hold him. He kept busting out of the chains. And it says that night and day he lived among the tombs and on the mountains. He was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And so here's a guy that if you would have looked at him and looked at his behavior, you'd be like, man, that guy's a maniac. That guy's a freak. He's always howling all hours of the day and night. He's cutting himself with sharp rocks. Guy's not mentally stable. The reality is this guy was being intensely influenced by demonic forces. In fact, later on in the story, what we see is that this guy was possessed by a legion of demons. That's what he said, a legion of demons. In those days, legion was a military term. A legion would have been 6,000 Roman soldiers. Now, most, most scholars don't think that This guy was actually possessed by 6,000 demons. They don't think it was literally 6,000 demons that were possessing him, but rather that term legion was used to basically say this guy had a lot of demons. And so Jesus showed up and he drove this legion of demons out of this this man, and he was set free. It's a beautiful story. You should look at it in Mark chapter 5. But as we think about this generation, our kids, our grandkids, the stuff that they have to deal with on a daily basis. As you think about the bullying that takes place in our schools, the cyberbullying, the shaming and name-calling, you think about acts of violence, you think about school shootings, you think about all the horrific things that they have to deal with on a daily basis. There's no denying that there are spiritual forces of evil that are at work in the world. I was just reading an article about this the other day. The American Psychological Association reports that roughly 17% of teenagers will experience or engage in some form of self-harm at least once in their lifetime. 17% of teenagers will cut themselves with a sharp object just like this guy in the story. Now, I'm not suggesting that all self-harm is driven by demons. I realize there are Other issues, there's mental and psychological issues that contribute to that. But let's not be naive to think that there's not more going on here. That article, which wasn't written from a Christian perspective, it was um, from Harvard Health, but the article identified three contributing factors to adolescent self-harm. There's psychological factors, 
There's biological factors and there's social factors, which I don't disagree with any of those. But I would add a fourth. I think there's spiritual factors. There's spiritual factors that are at play. There are unseen spiritual forces of evil that are at play and are impacting the mental health of this generation. The enemy's still playing the same game. He's still up to the same tricks. He's only got one plan. Steal, kill, and destroy everything that matters to you and everything that matters to God. Third thing the demons do is they desire to lure you away from God. They'll study you. They know your weaknesses. And they'll do whatever they possibly can to lure you away from God. This is what it says in 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 and 2. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. What Paul's saying is that there are, there are some people who are going to be steered away from faith in God because of the influence of deceptive spirits. Satan hates God. And if you're a follower of God, that means he hates you too. And he will do whatever he possibly can to sever, to drive a wedge into that relationship between you and God. That's what he does. That's why oftentimes when someone comes to faith in Jesus, their life gets exponentially more difficult. Problems, pain, hardship, difficulty, financial stress, marital issues, all of these things start flooding into their life. Following Jesus doesn't make your life easier. No, in fact, oftentimes it gets harder because now you're not just fighting against the people in your life or the situations and circumstances that you run into each and every single day, but now you have a very real enemy that you're fighting against as well. And he will go to work overtime to attack you, to pester you, to tempt you, to complicate and confuse your life all the while trying to convince you to believe that it's all God's fault. That's what he does. That's how the enemy works. I've talked to so many people who have shared with me that they started leaning into God's purposes for their life. They started walking in obedience. They started praying. They started reading scripture. They started giving. They started serving in the church. They maybe went on a missions trip. And the second that they did that, life got complicated. You go, why? Well, it's because Satan, the enemy, knows that you're getting closer to God. And he doesn't like that. He doesn't want that. And finally, the fourth thing the demons do so they want to paralyze you with fear. They want you to go through life always worried, always anxious, always fearful, always on edge. For some of you, this is how you live your life. You're always worried. Worried about your kids, worried about your marriage, worried about your finances, worried about your future, worried about your job, worried about what's going on in the world, worried about everything. Why? Because Satan, through his demons, wants to paralyze you with fear. Because when you're gripped with that kind of fear, it impacts the way you see the world. It impacts your mental well-being. It impacts your confidence. It impacts your peace. It impacts everything. And it will eventually begin to erode your trust in God, which is exactly what the enemy wants. Listen to what Paul writes in 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. He says, for God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. A spirit of fear is a very real spirit, but it comes from the enemy. It comes from the one who wants to rip you apart and destroy you. And one of the ways that he does it is by getting you to believe lies 
that will cause you to be gripped with fear. That's not from God. God doesn't want us living in fear. And I think what happens so often is the enemy sneaks into our lives and he just subtly begins to reduce our view of God. I mean, just earlier, we sang about this massive God. We sang all praise to the Lord Most High. All praise to the one who saved my life. All praise to Jesus Christ, High King of Heaven, my King forever. We sang about a God who's enthroned on on the highest of heavens, unrivaled. Do you think he's afraid of anything today? Do you think he's worried about what's going on in the world? Now, of course, he's concerned, he cares, he's not worried. There is nothing that causes him to tremble. Listen, you've got to understand, Satan and his demons, they hate you. They despise you. They want to take you out. They want to destroy you. And so we need to be on guard. How do we do that? Three things. First of all, we never treat the enemy lightly. So there's a story in Scripture in Acts chapter 19. This is what it says. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Isn't that wild? It's kind of like a reverse exorcism, right? Like these guys show up claiming to be able to exorcise demons, to drive out demons, and instead of them driving the demons out, the demons drove them out. And so the point is, We need to be careful because the enemy is far more powerful than what we realize. Second principle is we don't flirt with the darkness. We don't dabble in the occult or dark magic or any of that kind of stuff. So I remember when I was younger, I was a kid, went to this camp. We were there for a few days, stayed overnight, and one evening, and I wasn't there to witness this, but I heard all about it because some of the people from my dorm came back and they were totally freaked out. But essentially what they were doing is they were having a kid lay out flat on the ground and then several of them circled around and they started saying, light as a feather, stiff as a board. Light as a feather, stiff as a board. Light as a feather, stiff as a board. And then they each put four fingers underneath of this guy and just slowly lifted. And apparently, according to the people that were there, he came up off of the ground. And they attributed this to, to spirits that were at work. I also remember when I was a kid hearing about other kids that were messing around with Ouija boards and asking all kinds of weird questions of the Ouija board. And the, the, apparently they were guided, supposedly, by, by the spirits to an answer. Let me just tell you, that's not the Holy Spirit that's working. You know, a lot of times we want to sort of minimize and trivialize these things and say, yeah, it's all fun and games, you know, nobody's going to get hurt. I mean, they even market this stuff to kids now. But the reality is when we dabble and we mess with this kind of stuff, we're opening ourselves up to all kinds of destruction. That's what the enemy wants. Scripture says this in Deuteronomy 18, verses 10 to 12. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer or a charmer or a medium or a necromancer or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. Now, while these words were specifically written to the nation of Israel, the covenant people of God, the Old Testament, warning them not to embrace some of the, the cultic pagan practices of the Canaanites, they're just as relevant for us today. I mean, the principle remains. If you open yourselves up 
to these things, then there's going to be all sorts of evil that may come flooding into your life, and you don't even realize it. But you're giving the enemy a way in. You're giving him a, a crack in the door, and that's all he needs. So we don't mess around with the enemy. The demonic realm is nothing to mess around with. Finally, the third thing we need to remember is that we don't fight with our own power. We fight with God's authority. What you and I need to know is that we are absolutely powerless to do battle with the enemy on our own. We can't do it. We don't have it in us. Instead, we fight with the authority of God through the name of Jesus Christ. Here's what scripture says in Matthew 10 verse 1. And he, Jesus, called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out. Notice Jesus didn't give his disciples power. He gave them authority. And so this kind of came to my mind the other day. I was picking up one of my kids early from school because they had an appointment. And as I was driving down the street in front of the school, I noticed that there were crossing guards. You've probably seen this on Mal Avenue. You know, crossing guards will come out. And anytime kids wanted to cross the street, the crossing guard would come out and hold up a stop sign, and all the traffic would stop. The kids would walk across the street, and then the crossing guard would kind of go back to the sidewalk. And I got to thinking, <laughs> what if I tried that? Like, what if one day I just walked out into the middle of traffic and was like, everybody stop. I don't think it would go very well. I got to believe there would be people who are like, who's this guy? Like, why does he think he can just come out here, stop traffic, and hold us all up? Like, we got places to go. Get out of the road. Like, you don't have the power to make me stop. But if I put on a reflective vest and I got me one of those stop signs and I had some shirt or something that identified that I work for the school and then I went out there and I held up that stop sign and I stopped traffic, no one would think anything of it. They would be perfectly fine. Why? Because I was stopping traffic in the name and in the authority of the school that stands behind me. When we engage in spiritual battle, we don't go to fight with our own power, our own credentials, our own weapons, but rather we step into battle in the name and the authority of Jesus Christ. That's how we get victory over the forces of darkness. We fight with faith. We fight with what Paul calls the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I mean, think about how Jesus did battle with the enemy. After 40 days and 40 nights of fasting in the wilderness, Satan came to him and he said, man, you gotta be hungry. I mean, aren't you the son of God? Why don't you just take a stone and turn it into a loaf of bread? You can do that, right? You remember what Jesus said? He said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So Satan came at him again. And he said, why don't you just jump off of this mountaintop and the angels of heaven will sweep in and, and snatch you up. God can do that for you, right? And again, remember what Jesus said? He said, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And so Satan came at him one more time. Why? Because he's relentless. He won't stop. He won't give up. He'll keep coming at you over and over and over again. Just because you win one battle doesn't mean the war is over. Because he's showing up tomorrow. And he's showing up the next day. And he's showing up the day after that. And so he came to Jesus again. He took him up to, onto a high mountaintop and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and he said, I have got the deal of the century for you. All you have to do is bow down. Bow down and worship me and I'll give all of this to you. Which was absolutely ridiculous because Satan didn't have the authority to give that to Jesus anyways. But once again, Jesus fought back and he said, it is written, 
you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Be gone, Satan. And Satan fled. Three times the enemy came at Jesus, attacking him, tempting him. And three times Jesus fought off those attacks directly with the word of God from the book of Deuteronomy. This is why it's so important to know the scriptures. This is why it's so important to know the Bible. Because that's our weapon. That's how we engage in the battle. I'm not talking about filling your mind with a bunch of facts and Bible knowledge and trivia and all of this stuff and just tucking it away up there somewhere. No, I am talking about having a deep, rich understanding of the scriptures to the point that they transform our lives. I'm talking about spending time each and every single day reading the word of God, allowing it to saturate us so that when the enemy comes with his lies, which is what he's going to do, scripture calls him the father of lies. Lying is his native tongue. That's all he knows how to do. And so when the enemy comes at you with his lies, you can call it what it is because you know the voice of truth. Last week, we briefly looked at James 4, verses 7 and 8, where James says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. There's some of you right now that if you had to be honest, you would say, You know what? My life is not submitted to God. I mean, there are parts of it that are submitted to God, but not all of it is submitted to God. And so I just want to ask you the question. I want you to think about this. What part of your life do you need to submit to God? What part of your life do you need to surrender to the lordship of Jesus? Something you can talk to God about in prayer. Because when we submit, when we're submitted to God, James says that we can resist the devil. We can't resist the devil on our own. But in the power and the strength and the authority of God, we can resist the devil. And scripture says that he'll flee. Just like Jesus, we can say, you have no place here, Satan. You can't touch my family. You can't touch my finances. You can't touch my peace. You can't touch my confidence. Get out of here, Satan. In the name of Jesus. And scripture says that when we do that, he's out the door. And in verse 8, this is so beautiful. James writes, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. You're not alone. You're not alone. You've got a God who is with you, who is for you. He's fighting on your behalf. And you can have victory. You can have breakthrough in your life. You can experience freedom from the demons that have been haunting you when you submit your life to Jesus. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That's the hope we have today, church. Be encouraged. Jesus, we thank you that you are the one who is enthroned in heaven, the all-powerful one, the one who stands outside of space and time, the one who rules over kings and kingdoms and nations, all powers and principalities. You reign over all things, God. And yet the presence and the activity of Satan and his demons is very real and very ominous and very present in our lives in both seen and subtle ways. So often the enemy wants to influence us and we don't even realize it because it's not overt. It's just so subtle. And sometimes we get so caught up in that that culture that he has worked to create, in this, this world that he's fought so hard to create that things that just seem so normal to us because they've been a part of our experience for so long are actually breaking the heart of a holy God in heaven. 
And so, God, I pray that you'd give us wisdom, that you'd give us discernment, that you'd give us guidance, that you would give us a, a, an appreciation for the word of God. Give us a love for the word of God. You have given us a tremendous resource through your word that helps guide us. We get to hear your voice. But God, you've also given us your spirit. Those of us who have put our faith in you, you have given us your Holy Spirit to fight against these evil spirits that come at us each and every single day. And so I pray that that spirit that lives within us, that same spirit that raised Jesus up out of the grave would rise up within us, that we would stand strong, that we would stand firm, that we would be people who are unshaken in our confidence in a good and gracious God, and that in, a, in the midst of a world where there's so much darkness and so much brokenness and so much hopelessness, that we, your people, your church, would shine brightly, that we would model and demonstrate a different way of living, a better way of living, the Jesus way of living that looks so radically different from what we see all around us. And God, I pray that you would be honored and glorified because a day is coming where every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And God, on that day, there'll be no more opportunity for repentance. There'll be no more opportunity for salvation. And so might we be about the business that you've called us to in the here and the now. Might we live faithfully as your people proclaiming with our lips and with our lives that Jesus is Lord today. Might we have an impact and an influence on the people around us, the people in our community, the people in our state and nation and all around the globe. Might they see and savor Jesus as Lord over all things to your honor and your glory, we pray. Amen.